Okay. Um, Polly texted me this morning. She has a sore throat, so we'll pray for her. Okay. So we have Polly number two, second Polly again. He's going to cover for her. But Polly said, don't get comfortable, Carrie, because she's already looking forward to coming back. All right. <laughs> Substitute, not replacement. All right. Um, my voice sounds a little weird. I apologize. I too had a throat thing this week, but, um, you know, whenever your throat starts acting up, especially the night before, you just kind of know, like in the morning, it's going to really hurt. You ever have that feeling? So I prayed before I went to bed, like, Lord, please make this go away. Cause I really want to come in and teach this Sunday, but not my will. Your will be done. Maybe there's a purpose for it. So I go to sleep. This is earlier in the week. And I wake up at like three in the morning, right? We talked about the three in the morning thing and it's, it's killing me. I'm like, oh no, I'm like, I'm gonna have to call Tom or someone to substitute for me. And I pray again. I'm like, God, please take this away. I go back to sleep for a few more hours, wake up in the morning and to my amazement, it's completely gone. It doesn't hurt or anything. Just a little lingering thing that's been around for a couple of days, but no pain. It's been, never had that happen before. So, uh, God is good all the time. All the time. Um, and it's, it's actually kind of convenient because, uh, it segues me into what I wanted to talk about before we get started. It's been on my heart this week to pray, to really pray for you guys. I said last week that you've been very encouraging for me. Encouragers is the appropriate name for this class. So I want to encourage you and second Corinthians chapter 12, verse seven was it just kept coming to my mind this week, thinking about you guys. So I thought I'd share it with you. You might have it memorized because you guys are so wise, but I do not. So this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians about his vision that he had, whether in the body, he does not know, but God knows. Um, but to keep him from pride, he says the following. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of these revelations that God has shown him, a thorn was given, was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. When I am weak, then I am strong. So I just wanted to start off with that. Maybe that will be encouraging for you. I know when you have a class as wise as this class, things happen. You get illnesses, your body starts to break down. I'm, I'm 37 and, and already I'm not looking forward to becoming 38 next month. All right. So <laughs> please rapture happen. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I'm praying for you guys, but yeah, it's, it's encouraging to keep Paul in mind as an example, that no matter our hardships, what's going on in our life, that, uh, you know, God's grace is sufficient. Yeah. So maybe next weekend when you're with your families and they ask you, how are you doing? You can say, oh, I got this wrong with me and this wrong with me. And then you can end it with, but God's grace is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Let's go ahead and. Kick it off with some prayer here. Father God, once again, thank you so much for bringing us here this Sunday morning so we can come together to learn more about you and your word so we can share with others for your glory because that's what this is all about. So you be the glory, my God. And it might be raining, but we still have a turnout here. So please use us um, to your glory. May your truth prevail. That's all we care about is your truth, my God. And although there may be ailments in this class, we know your grace is sufficient. But if you are willing, we ask that you take these ailments from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And since my throat does sound kind of funky, I'm going to use it. All right. So whenever I have to read from the Bible, it's going to get really deep, like God deep. Here we go. <laughs> I'm looking at it as a gift. All right. The end will be like the beginning. So we're going to, again, like we always do, we're going to recap what we went over last week briefly. If my thing will work, there we go. Spoiler alert. All right. So we had to cut a little short last week, and that's okay. So last week we talked about how God formed man out of the dust of the ground, like a potter. God being the potter at the wheel, the dust of the ground being the clay, and then man being the creation that he was intimately involved with. 
God literally breathing into the uh, into Adam's or Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Remember, Lord God was used for the first time in this chapter, uh, indicating God's close involvement. Man was made more intimate than how he brought to life all other living creatures. Okay? Again, comparing and contrasting man with animals. All living creatures are made with an eternal soul and spirit, but only man was made in the image of God. That is what sets us apart. Okay? What does that mean? To really hammer this nail in, man has a deeper non-physical nature, like free will, morals, logic, and uh, Tom's not in here. But I, he's on his way. We might have to revisit this. But I talked to Tom after class last week. You know, we talked about how smart words are. I knew Tom had some good gems for us, and and he did. But he he kept it from us. So I was hoping he'd share it this morning. But maybe we can get to it later. But I also learned, you know, crows are also a very smart bird. They might even be smarter than ravens, but I'm no ornithologist. I don't know these things, okay? But uh, what else is, what else sets us apart as being made in uh, God's image is that we were made to create. On some level, we are creators. We're not the creator, but we can have this creativeness to us. We also talked about how God planted the Garden of Eden. In the east. And every tree that God planted was pleasant and good. He said that. Pleasant and good for the sight, for the food, for the soul, for the spirit. I would say especially the tree of life, right? That's why it's going to exist in the eternal state. In, in Revelation it tells us that. More than one tree apparently lining that river. However, I'd say not so much the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because as we're about to read in chapter 3, you know, you will die if you eat from it, all right? So it might have been pleasant and good to look at, but to actually consume, not so much. And we talked about how the tree itself isn't evil, but it's the act of disobedience because God said, don't. And it was put next to the tree of life in the middle of the garden to test Adam. God loves to test. God tests, but he does not tempt. There's a difference. Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Right, but God tests, and he does that for our benefit. We talked about how it's the act of disobedience that is evil. That is what sin is. It's disobeying a perfect God who is self-existent. So the tree itself isn't evil in and of itself, but we're going to continue that conversation today because we had to cut it a little bit short last week. So, Chapter 16, verse 17, this is where we left off. We're going to start it off with a question. And last week we went deeper as time progressed. We're going to start, we're going to start pretty deep, okay? So I hope your minds are jogged. I hope you got your coffee. So here's a question. If you got your papers, number one. If evil is the intention to disobey God or the act of disobedience, what is the genesis of evil? Like where did it come from? What is its origins? All right. Obviously, good not, goodness comes from God, but where, where did evil come from? All right. So I postulate that to you. I ask you, what do you guys say? Have you ever, have you, I never really thought about this kind of stuff before. Have you guys ever really thought about this? Yeah, June? Um, if we don't have a choice, then we're just robots. And so we have to have a choice to obey God or disobey God. Because otherwise, we don't really have a, a good, a full relationship. Exactly. Free will, right? Free will comes from God. Uh, it started with Satan because he's the one who started all this in the first place. That's right. Blame Satan. And then Adam. Adam. <laughs> Sorry, that joke's probably getting old for everybody, but not me. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I knew I could depend on you guys. Free will, that's a good answer to Satan. That's. It's great, all right. I will be like the most high, Isaiah. I am. You're becoming your own. I am, right? Good, awesome. So let's let's break this down a little bit. I've got to remind myself to go slow. And I had two energy drinks this morning. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, children start very young. Um, well, if you tell them no, and they will put their hand out. And these are kids that are, you know, four months old, 
and they will deliberately do what they're not supposed to do. And you can tell by their actions that they know they're disobeying what was told. You probably remember that with your kids. They start young yeah. <laughs> disobeying. Original sin, right? Like, yep. yep. You're born into sin, and it's pretty obvious with those toddlers, right? I don't even have kids, but. Oh, not toddlers. I'm talking about. Even four younger, or five yeah. Months, yeah. And they will deliberately. Yeah. Ah. And the Bible say they come from the womb telling lies. Yeah. I mean, you guys have kids, you tell me. <laughs> perfect angels. Yo, perfect angels, all right. No bias there whatsoever. <laughs> Jack, you're funny. Okay, so evil, or other words, disobedience, must have already occurred by the time God planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the knowledge of it all was already there. Does that make sense? If we got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then evil already happened. This goes to what? I'm sorry, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Matt. Matt? P-A-T. Pat. Pat. All right. I'm going to forget this. <laughs> all right. I might have the body of a 37-year-old, but it's like 120 up here. All right. Um. Yeah, so obviously by this time, Satan already rebelled, right? Because that's that was the first act of disobedience, was Satan's rebellion, that we're told in the Bible at least, okay? So remember, evil is technically nothing. And that's a weird way to look at it, because it is the act of disobedience, but it's, it's the act of committing disobedience against a God that, that is responsible for everything, okay? It's the rebellion against the great I Am, against the source of all existence. Evil exists when people rebel against God. So that's really way, that's really weird to wrap your mind around that. Evil is really like disobeying everything and, and agreeing in some sense with nothing, but at the same time it exists when you do the act of rebelling. And as Pat was saying, Satan was the first created being to commit evil, and then Adam and Eve followed up with the first humans to commit evil. So Kevin's tap short story. Okay. I deliberately made time to put this in here. Story time. Jesus loves stories, right? Kevin loves stories. So back in my um, backsliding days, I, the blinders were going over my eyes, right? Too much time not praying, not being in the word. The, the world starts to overtake the mind. So I was like, hmm, I want to get tattoo sleeves. Yeah, tattoo sleeves. Those are cool. So I made my appointment and I, and I went there and I had my consultation and I put down my deposit. And this guy, this tattoo artist was like the, the best in, in Ohio, probably. He was really good, right? And uh, so he was so good that he was booked up like four months in advance. So I had to wait four months to go to my first actual appointment to have the tattoo started. And between that time of my consultation and my first appointment, God just so happened to pull me out. Because I was a Christian, but I was backsliding. And he's faithful even when we're not. So he pulled me out. And the binders came off. And I was like, oh, should I really do this, God? I mean, I made my deposit, but is this really what you want? So I prayed. I started praying for days, maybe even weeks. I don't remember. But I was praying, if this is not your will, God, then block it. Don't let it happen. All right. Well, I put the money down, so I'm going to plan on doing it. But you let me know if I shouldn't. And I later learned, months, months later, that this is actually like a biblical thing. Uh, the story of Abraham, when a servant goes to the well to search for a wife for Isaac, he's like, God, if you, you show me who you want me to choose for Isaac's wife and let, him, let her do this and this and feed the camels, the water and that stuff. So it's kind, of, it's kind of like a biblical concept. So anyway, I was praying these things like, God, if you don't want this, put it in my heart not to do it. You know, close that door. So I haven't heard from the tattoo artist guy. The months are going by. And then... The night before my appointment, or maybe it was the morning of actually, because it was supposed to be that afternoon, he called or he texted me and he's like, hey man, I'm sick. And I had this weird feeling before that, that this was not going to happen. I just had this weird feeling. It's not going to happen. So he texts me, he's sick. And I'm like, okay, don't worry about it, man. I hope you feel better. He's like, we'll reschedule it for next month. I'm like, okay. And I was like, God, I think you're telling me you don't want me to do this. So just confirm it. Do one more thing for me. Confirm it and I won't do it. I don't care if I'm out the money. I just want to do what you want me to do. And so between that month that went by, I was like, he still hasn't told me. I hope he didn't die. <laughs> I hope it wasn't that kind of a sickness, but he's not telling me. I don't like we only had the consultation. He hasn't shown me any mock-ups that he did. The night before 
he, he texts me images of his, his quick drawings of the tattoos, and I could tell he totally forgot about it. He just kind of threw them together. And as soon as I saw him, like, it just drained me. I was like, I don't want this. I don't want this on my body. And I was like, thank you, God. This is what I, this is what I needed to know. So he closed that door. He took it out of my heart. Um, and because I kind of have a social media following, I was like, whoa, this is like divine intervention right here. I'm going to share this as like a witness thing. So I did online and a lot of people appreciated it. There's this one guy who commented, like, he commented, do you see why atheists have a problem with this supposed God? Because while he's supposedly occupying himself with things like this tattoo, there are starving people in Africa. I was like, yeah, that's a good point if you're an unbeliever, but it's really not a good point because the only thing I, I replied back to him, because the Bible tells us, you know, don't entertain scoffers, we only do it for the wise. So all I said to him was, where do you think evil and starvation comes from? And I, that's all I said. If he was wise, he'd figure it out. It comes from disobedience. My act of obedience, if, if everyone would just obey God, there wouldn't be starving kids in Africa. But we know that's not going to be the case because when Jesus comes back, that's going to be perf perfection. And even then, Satan's got to be, be loosed and people will start rebelling again. So really, this guy was trying to put blame on me for considering, considering getting this tattoo, but it's the act of obedience. If everyone would just obey, if he would stop putting himself as his own God and obey God, then there wouldn't be these starving kids in Africa. All right? One thing I noticed is I got more serious about my faith is that I'm more charitable. All right? That comes with the Holy Spirit doing his work in you. Anyway, I thought I'd share that and uh, do with what you will with that information, but it's obedience. That's what God wants. And that's what David Jeremiah said that we went over last week. He, he, he said that the first thing God asked of us wasn't to love. It was obedience. If you want to walk with me, then do what I say. Yeah, yeah Jack. In 1994, I was healed of prostate cancer. And I knew it when it happened. But, hey, hey, geez, geez. My wife had made me go through all these tests that really hurt. And sure enough. God healed me. But I started telling, I was a truck driver, and I, everywhere I'd go, I'd witness the people and tell them. And I told this one guy in a warehouse about God healed me. He sat there on the tow motor, and he looked at me, and he said, you mean to tell me all the sick people in this world? God healed you? I said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. So I followed him, and I, <clears throat> in my trailer and kept witnessing to him and he, he just wasn't fine. Mm -hmm. But he did. He healed me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, we kind of touched on that last week. God, God God has mercy on who he chooses to have mercy on. So, yeah. Maxine. You're talking about when you're away from God. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be, you know, my daughter-in-law was in the hospital, is still in the hospital. That had to be rushed to the hospital last Saturday, and she was really very critical and in ICU. But um, they had told her that she was going to have to be on, she had damaged her kidney so bad, she's going to have to be on um, dialysis probably the rest of her life. And it was, it just, and she had a tumor on her right kidney. Friday, Philip went in to see her, and she took him over and sat on the couch. She goes, What about your church? He said, the doctor came in this morning and he said, I don't know what happened during the night, but when we took your blood work this morning, there's no sign of toxins in your body. The tumor has shriveled up to nothing. And you will not have to have dialysis. And I mean, amazingly, my son was, he wrote me this thing, big sign, praise God for answered prayer. And uh, he, of course, she knows she's not allowed to, to drink ever again. She has damaged her kidneys. But she, that's the first thing she asked him, what about your church? Because he keeps telling her everybody's praying for her. So I just thank God this morning. You were talking about answers to prayer and healing. Mm -hmm. That was a real, even the doctor said it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. Because it, it should not have happened. Yeah. And so God has got her here for a purpose. So she didn't need to be here now, but God's got her here for a purpose. So 
I am just so thankful yeah. today for God to answer your prayer. Thank you, Maxine, for sharing that. Yeah. As long as your lungs draw breath, God is not finished with you. Even on your deathbed, your last words could be a witness to someone who needs to hear about Jesus. I think your story is that the God who planted the stars in the universe is also interested in the intimate details of our lives. As insignificant as we may think they are, He is there for us when we call upon Him. That's a good point. God being almighty, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, there is no problem too small or too great for Him. So while someone has some dumb thing he's dealing with with tattoos, he's also taking care of those in Africa, right? Yeah, this, this guy had a very small view of the God he didn't even believe in. Good point. All right, so deep we go. So Satan was the first to commit evil by rebelling. Adam and Eve followed suit because of Satan, but by their own free will. So evil must have been a possibility, though, for as long as God has existed. Now, that's something to really think about. And feel free to tune in here. We're getting pretty deep. For as long as God existed, the possibility for evil must have been always been there. That might make you nervous to kind of think about, but don't worry. We'll, we'll break it down. Even before Satan rebelled, maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Because free will has always existed in the Trinity. If God is eternal and there's always been free will there, this means in some way there, there, was a, there was possibility for evil to happen. And there's a little asterisk to put there, okay? And we'll get to that. Although evil, disobedience, sin, is the antithesis of God, the opposite in a way, and we'll talk more about that too, God has always known evil because God is omniscient and evil is just nothingness. Is, is that a true statement? Do you guys all concur with that? God is eternal and always has been omniscient, meaning all-knowing. That means he's always known about evil. Does that make sense? All right, good. No one's coming for me yet. <laughs> no one's tackled me yet. <laughs> so God, before he even made new Lucifer, knew Lucifer would commit the first evil. Does that make sense? He knew us before he created us. He knew who was predestination, the elect, that we talked about last week. And we'll get into more of that. We're going deep, so I'm, let's go slow. And here's my side note. God really has no opposite. All right. We talk about the Antichrist, the Antichrist. Supposedly the opposite of, of Christ. Christ has no opposite. The Antichrist is more, it's more accurately used in place of. All right. Nothing is God's opposite. Nothing. And you can look at that two different ways right now. <laughs> nothing is God. Literally nothing is God's opposite, but nothingness is God's opposite. Evil. Meditate on that, and your eyes will go cross-eyed, okay? Of course, no trying member, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, has chosen or ever will choose evil. That would be contradictory to God's nature. Contradictory to who God is, because God is. If God is, He is the I Am, then it'd be contradictory to who He is if He was to commit nothingness, evil, to contradict Himself. And he does not change, so he never will. I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3.6. We all good on that? Okay. <laughs> Deepness. So why did God create Lucifer knowing he would commit the first evil? And the same thing could be said about us. Well, he gave the angels... Freedom to choose. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that brings up the, the debate, are angels made in the image of God? If, they're made, if we're made just lower than the angels, the Bible says, um, and free will comes from the tri tri triune God, it would make sense that he would give angels and man who's made in his image free will. So he obviously gave it to the angels, and a third of them chose nothingness over somethingness or everythingness. So why did God create Lucifer knowing he would commit the first evil? And this is just where the Holy Spirit was leading me. In a way, and this is very reductive, and there's, this can go really deep, but in a way because something is better than nothing. This can go really deep, but just generally speaking, in a way because something is better than nothing. Obviously, we're created for his pleasure, right? 
God is the something. He's everything. Everything comes from him. Evil is the nothing. It makes sense that God would want more of that something that he is. Right? We're made in his image. So we're made for his pleasure. The Bible tells us that. So he wants more of that. He doesn't need it. He wants it. Okay? Even if that means some will spend eternity in hell. Because that's what they chose. That's what they choose still. And God is perfectly righteous or just. His justice is perfect. We might not see it that way. We might have questions. Why are there starving children in Africa? Do not lean on your own understanding. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So speaking of God's justice, why would some of us not be created to spend eternity with God in paradise just because some others chose evil? So if God didn't create any of us because some would choose evil, that wouldn't be justice because then we don't get a fair shake, those of us who are going to spend eternity with him. How does that relate to predestination? Good, good question. Yeah, predestination, the elect. God knows us before he brought us into the world. In some way, and this is where, it, yeah, zzz, cross-eyed. He knew us before he created us. He knew before we were even born who was going to be destined for eternity with him and who was going to hell. And God still chose to make them because of free will. That's who he is. Because if he decided not to make those he was going to send to hell, then that's not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not justice. That's not free will. Then people could say, you didn't give these people a fair shake. Because even though predestination and election is a thing, everyone still has the opportunity to go to heaven. And that might seem contradictory, but it's, that's the truth. God knew us before he knew us, so he put us in the right place at the right time, like Pharaoh, knowing who was already going to rebel. And he still uses them for his glory. Yeah, Jim, Dr. Jim. Romans eleven thirty three and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Yeah. That's where I am. Yeah. Do you guys see <laughs> this? There's some things I can't answer. You see the steam, the smoke coming out of my ears right now? You guys are just really challenging me here, right? I'd appreciate it if you backed off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I end up coming out of here with less brain cells because I'm killing them up here. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, Adam. So I've been really thinking a lot about the issue of free will. Yeah, right? yeah. And I was kind of confronted with a verse in Romans 9, 16, where it talks about God's mercy. I'll show mercy to whom I will show mercy and will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But verse 16 says, so it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. So like that whole issue of like we can choose to, to sin and rebel and go against God. And in essence, we're choosing hell. But at the same time, we can't choose to follow God because we're dead to sin. And dead to sin does not raise up by itself and choose to follow God. So there's a split instance there where God moves us to follow him. Oh, and that, talk about cross-eyed moment. Yeah. Right? And I think we, I talked about that in my very first lesson with you guys. I'm glad you brought that up. That is, we are so dead to our sins. Yeah. When we're born, four months old, disobeying, before we even know how to speak, that we don't even think about seeking God. So instead, in his mercy, he seeks us. Right? And he knocks on our heart. Yeah. You can't even come to God unless the Holy Spirit comes. Right. Right. It is. Yeah. And that's Becky, right, Becky? She spoke last week about how we can quench the Holy Spirit. And as I was just saying with my story, and those blinders start, that shade starts going on because you're not, you're not investing yourself in God like you should be. And the Spirit won't leave you, but you're not going to get those benefits, all right, that you get as a Christian. So. We are so dependent on the great I am, it's, it's insane, which is why we should really reach out to the lost because for some reason God chose us, right? And he's chose others and they might not know it yet, but we should have mercy on them because he had mercy on us. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, Jesus said he wanted 
everybody to come to him. But then his father said, what you said, some people are predestined to hell. So who's right? <laughs> which one and which again aren't always the same. And since we have been given free will, he wants us to come, but we choose yeah. many do not right. to come. He wants everyone to come, but he knows already that some will choose not. And no matter where he would put us in some way, before time began, he knew that no matter where he would put us on the human timeline, that unbelievers would still not be believers. So like Pharaoh, he'll use the unbelievers to his glory to make a point for the believers, I guess. Yeah. John 1, 12 and 13 say, but to, to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. But of God. That's it. If he's, if he's everything, everything revolves around him. Yeah. There are mysteries that we don't understand. <clears throat> and my answer to free will or predestination, both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, both. Yeah. Because we can't understand. Yeah. That's the that's like my default go to. Like we are three dimensional beings, four dimensional if you include time. God is above all of it. Therefore, have you ever tried to picture a four or five dimensional thing? You can't. You can try, but like a, it's so crazy. Like so, it makes sense that you could have one God with three persons in this higher cult realm or dimension. It all make this is crazy. This is thousands of years ago. This stuff was written, but even science today and all these higher dimensions, they all confirm like. The things of God are, heaven's going to be awesome. We're going to talk about that. Like how, I'm just going to say it now. All right. So one of my verses this month, and I do have this one memorized, so I hope I don't butcher this one, right, is uh, <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those, what's the rest of it? Those the, the, uh, those who love him. Yes. Oh, so, you know how crazy my mind is? Flying dragons to other planets in heaven? I don't know if that's a real thing, but that's what I kind of, that'd be fun, all right? If I can think of that, and God says, no matter what you think of, it's going to be better than that. Oh, we're in for a treat. <laughs> Carrie's embarrassed. Succeed. Me and my, <laughs> my dragons, yeah. I had a Muslim asking me one time to the Trinity, mm -hmm. and in my pitiful way, I did try. I said, You know, if you can't explain your God, He's no God at all. Yeah. He didn't say anything else. You can, if you can't explain your God, He's no God at all. That's that's true. Interesting. All right. Yes. Third John. I think this is a, a good segue in terms of being able to share the gospel, the things that you're pointing out, that God is something and evil is nothing. And uh, we have to accept the natural laws that God has provided. And part of that natural law is that God is a living hope and he is something and something is better than nothing. And if evil is nothing, why choose that? Uh, it's better to choose something um, All right. such as God. Yeah, kind of reminds me of the no atheist in the foxhole kind of thing. Like, yeah, and that's a very reductive way, like I was saying, to think of it as something and nothing, but that something is eternal something and that nothing is eternal nothing. That's why hell is that bottomless pit of destruction. Do you guys like talking about these characteristics of God? I think it's fascinating. God is fascinating. So I'll go as deep as he'll allow me to go. Hopefully not more than I can handle, like he promised. Otherwise, I will end up in a sane asylum, okay? <laughs> so if, man, uh, or if God predestines me to go to hell, mm -hmm. can I change his predestination for me? Can oh, man change it? Then I, have I would say, no, you can't change it. But if, if you do have the choice, though, so he would never have predestined you to, to go to hell if you can change it. So back on you. Ball's in your court. <laughs> I'm going to start speaking gibberish to you guys just so nobody wins. All right. <laughs> Predestination doesn't, you still have the free will choice. Mm -hmm. He's not making that choice for you. You're going to make it. He just knows how you're going to do. 
Yeah. 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 The, again, we're, we're, we're getting in the, the mind of God here and we're moving on now. <laughs> Very good, Pat. Thank you guys. Um, so this is, again, these are the verses we left off with last week, but we didn't get to this part. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And again, Yom, we talked about Yom at length. It can be a 24 hour day, like in the first chapter of Genesis. But here in the second chapter, we see it used with these three words. So it's a phrase in the day. Once again, this phrase as seen in verse four earlier in chapter two indicates a period of time, not a 24 hour day. So man, what God is saying here, man won't die in the same 24 hour day he eats from the tree of life, but the process of decay will begin the moment they do. All right. Does that make sense? Anybody have anything else to add to that? Because obviously, as soon as they ate from the tree, they didn't die. Right. Good thing, too, because then we wouldn't be here. But that's when entropy and decay and corruption came into would come into the world. And we'll get into that next chapter next week. Why would this happen? Because Adam disobeyed. And I think in, in the print offs, I have they. But then I realized the other day, I was like, oh, it's not really Adam and Eve. It's mostly Adam here. I mean, they both disobeyed, but it's because Adam's disobedience. Because Adam disobeyed God who gives eternal life. God who maintains and sustains. God in a way, or not God, but Adam in a way walked away from the great I am to do his own thing, become his own God in a way. Adam rebelled against he who is existence. Adam chose darkness over light. Again, darkness can be a metaphor for unknowing, being lost, the blind being blind. Adam chose that eternal nothingness over that eternal somethingness. That's why corruption came into the world. But we know something of God. We know who He is. We know of His mercy. We know of His faithfulness. We know of His grace. We know of His love. We know that He's going to do, we know what He's going to do in the books to follow to remedy the situation and save the creation, his creation, all right? It didn't just, it didn't just end there. God's amazing. Like, many times as I've screwed up in my life, it just, it just humbles me to know that he hasn't given up on me. And he didn't give up on Adam and Steve either. Adam and Eve. <laughs> then, then the Lord God said, and, and this, we're going to go deep again, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper for him, helper for him. Why did God say it's not good to be alone? All right, like, don't read that last part. All right, you have to answer it first. <laughs> Why is it not good for man to be alone? This is interesting. Everything God creates is good, and we'll get to this, but let's talk about this first. Some, some of, I mean, I like my alone time, but really it's more so like now, is so I can be with God and talk to him. But why is it good, not good for man to be alone? Why do you think? Any theories? Drink time? Cheers to your theories. We probably starved to death, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we wouldn't know how to get dressed or what to wear. So. <laughs> well, at this time, they didn't get dressed, right? And we'll talk about that. <laughs> That's interesting, Pat. All right. So... Let's get humorous. God himself's words never alone. And I did that on purpose just to irritate Carrie. All right. God is one in three persons, right? God himself's words never alone. That's my joke for today. All right. If I ever write my own interpretation of the Bible, the, the King Kevin version, I'm going to write it like that. Uh, let's go. Tom, I saw his hand first. And I'm sorry, what's your name again? Kent, we'll go with Kent. Um, I, it just occurred to me when you put that up that I think people need a sounding board to talk back and forth and share their ideas. And that, that is probably the reason he said it's not good for you to be alone. Because there's, there's going to be someone there to say, I don't think that's a very good idea to jump off the top of that tree. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right uh, Kent, I knew that. I don't bad my memory is. Well, if we were alone, 
then we would be self-consuming and we would only think about ourselves. Wow, yeah. And so that would then be contrary to the rest of the things that we read in the Bible is to consider others as more important than yourself, to seek to serve others, uh, humility, all those kinds of things would go out the door if there was nobody else. You teach. You teach the class. <laughs> That's such a great answer. And that makes so much sense because when Jesus came, he humbled himself, right? And God doesn't like pride. That's a great answer. Tom and Becky. I think that God doesn't want us to be alone because we're not really complete. And the opposites attract is what makes us complete because there are things I can't do that he can and vice versa. Plus, even with personality differences, we are like sandpaper to our mate. If we have rough edges, it is really their right and responsibility to help us see those rough edges and get them smoothed out so that we're not an offense to the world. I wonder why Tom had all those wounds on his body. You're my sandpaper. <laughs> what grain are you? Are you a heavy grain or a thick grain? Yeah. God is about relationship. That's who he is, right? And that's who he is, and that's why... It's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, without this other person and woman to come along, God's creation wouldn't expand. Yeah. That's another good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. God, if God's not alone, then obviously to be alone is not good because God is good and he's not alone. He always had the Trinity, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It, it, yeah, good, good. And, and we're going to get into that with the creation of Eve and why she was, she came on the scene. Um, <laughs> God is good. So God was never alone. He always had a three person of the Trinity. God is good. We talked about this before in the Gospels. Polly number two, second Polly, will you read James 1.17? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Okay. So, yeah, God, God is God is good. He doesn't change. We talked about that. Um, but but we're, we're you might start to see a, a, a perceived problem here in a second, and we're going to address it. All right. How did perfect God create something not good? He created Adam and said it is not good that Adam is alone. Uh, how dare you bring this up? Okay, because this is too much for me. All right. He didn't, he didn't say that the man is not good. No. The situation. The situation's not good. Yeah. All right. Everything God creates is automatically beneath him. We talked about that, right? And some on some level. Especially and I always like to think of it as time first. If God is timeless, but he creates something, in some way time starts because it has a beginning. So it's automatically the things he creates is beneath him. And this got so deep for me when I was preparing this that I just turned to Bible commentary. So I'm going to read this for you. What's especially interesting about this statement, about this thing being not good, is at this point, God is wholly responsible for the state of the world. This is not after the fall of man, but before it. So before corruption came on the scene. Why then is something God created being called not good by God himself, no less? In short, only God can be perfect. So anything which is not God cannot be completely perfect. And we have already seen God choose to create through a process of creation and modification. It is not only logically possible, but inevitable that part of God's creation will be less than, per less than perfect in the sense that God is perfect. You can still be perfect in our eyes, and, but as far as being on the same tier as God, nope. So I thought that was really interesting. If you disagree with this, by all means, come back next week and let me have it. I'm always willing to learn, all right? So it's not good that he's alone. I will, he will solve this problem. He will make a helper fit for him. All Shaw, to do, fashion, accomplish, work. Warning, the whammon are coming. Guys, ah, run. Okay. <laughs> the whammon are coming on the scene to be continued. All right. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens 
and brought to them and brought them to the man. So the first thing I took from this is out of the ground, he created them. Evolutionists will say out of the seas or some sort of primordial soup. So there's a contradiction right there out of the ground from the dust. Now this is the same word formed. The same word for formed was mentioned previously for man in verse seven. So both man and animal formed out of the ground. And the Lord God led them to Adam like he would later do for Noah. Huh. Two by two to Adam, I guess. All right. God works some patterns. He, he tried and true methods, I guess, don't change. Okay. To see, deep again we go, to see what he would call them. What would Adam call these animals that God created for his pleasure? And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So the Lord God wanted to see but Adam would name the animals. Hmm, that tells us something about God. It, well, we know that. Look at what he created. All right. I'm sorry, I don't raise my hand. You, know, I'm not the you don't need to raise your hand, all right? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay with being cut off because I value what you guys have to say more than what comes out of my own mouth. Isn't God all-knowing, though? So here you have God wanting to see He's curious about what Adam's going to name these animals, but God's omniscient, right? Any thoughts popping into your head? What's the Holy Spirit poking you with? Okay. Nothing? Ten minutes starting now. Here we go. Wait. Just kidding. Polly, second Polly, Psalm 139, please. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Before Adam even named an animal, God already knew what he was going to call it, right? That's what the Bible says before he, any word was ever on his tongue. So I started getting deep into this, and we'll see where it leads us here. I guess God can choose to suspend his own knowledge. And I know that probably seems blasphemous or weird, but let's just, let's just see where this leads us, all right? We know God the Son also did this when he became a man. When Jesus became a man, what he, he, he humbled himself. And we know that um, from Hosea 4, 6. Oh, yeah, first, um, Carrie, will you read that, Luke? And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So if Jesus is increasing in wisdom, that means he didn't have it all to begin with. So he can choose to suspend his own knowledge because Jesus is God. So maybe that's what God's doing here with Adam. He, he knows this. Maybe he chooses not to know it. Maybe, I don't know. Well, let's keep it going and see where this takes us. Hosea 4.6 writes, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is where the Spirit led me, to this verse. So if God can suspend his own knowledge, but people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Oh, have I lost you guys? No? I'm losing myself here. But that's, not the full, that's not the full verse, all right? Because why, why are we destroyed for lack of knowledge? Because we reject it. We reject knowledge. This isn't God rejecting it. He's maybe suspending it, right? You reject knowledge and I reject you from being a priest to me. So it's that, re that deliberate rejection of knowledge, but not just any kind of knowledge. This is in the context of Hosea. This is moral knowledge that he's talking about. Moral knowledge, good and evil kind of knowledge. And that's not the kind of knowledge that we're talking about here in Genesis. It's not good or evil to, or it's definitely not evil to, to suspend knowledge about naming animals, right? There, there is a difference. And remember, God creates both light and darkness, both literally and metaphorically. And he even called darkness very good in Genesis 1. Everything he created was very good, and there was darkness. He makes light and creates darkness. And if we take that metaphorically, that's for understanding and not understanding Knowledge, not having knowledge. So this tells us that not knowing some things isn't necessarily bad. That's something weird to think about. In some cases, not having knowledge isn't bad. And, and when I was like, when I do these lesson plans, I don't know if I black out and I just keep typing. But when I just did a one walkthrough through this yesterday, I came to this part. And I was like, whoa, where'd that come from? This is coming around full circle too. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
That's what, that's what we're talking about, the knowledge of the tree of, of good and evil. In fact, oftentimes, it can be good to not have knowledge. God didn't want us to eat from the knowledge of good and evil because of that knowledge of evil. Like someone was saying last week, maybe he was like a protective father and didn't want us to, like he knows, he has the knowledge of evil, but he doesn't want us to have it because we, we're not God. We can't handle that. Yeah. <sighs> God impresses me. Like <laughs> not having knowledge also leaves opportunity for surprises. Wake up. Yeah. And we talked about how God must love surprises, and I'm gonna back it up today because I keep saying it. I don't think I ever gave you a verse for it. I'm gonna give you two. We know God enjoys surprises. First Samuel, Polly number two. And then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Your ears will tingle. That's a surprise. And that verse I just had memorized, I don't really want to repeat because I'll butcher it this time. The, the uh, no, no mind can conceive the things God has prepared for those who love him. You know, at that time, God loves surprising. That, oh, there it is. First, first Corinthians 2.9. God also enjoys sarcasm. We went over that last week in Job 38. <laughs> Tell me these things, Job, if you know so much in your old ripe age of 30 years old or however old he was, he wasn't 30. But... And we know God has a sense of humor. 1 Samuel chapter 5 is when, was it the Philistines who uh, took the ark? I forget, it was the Canaanites. Someone took the ark from the Israelites and they put it in their own temple. And they had that idol of the dragon in there. And so what does God do? He makes it bow down to the ark, and then he cuts off its arms or whatever. That's hilarious, okay? <laughs> also, Psalm 59, 8. This verse up here also tells us that God has a sense of curiosity, I guess. Would that surprise us if we know God loves surprises and he has a sense of humor? We were created for his pleasure. God can experience pleasure. And here's the thing. We are made in his image and we have these things. We're sarcastic. We enjoy surprises. At least some of us do. Maybe not jump scares and scary movies. All right. God has a sense of humor. Some of you do. Okay. Oh, we got one back there. All right. And we enjoy, you know, we're curious people. That's why we go explore things. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name, stamped. And this verse also shows us how God wanted us to rule and reign with him. That was the point. Whatever Adam said, there it shall be. God allowed Adam to have full autonomy on naming creation. So Adam, like God, but in a lesser sense, because he's not a God, was a creator, but not the creator. Okay? And again, by allowing Adam to do this, God is not working through us or Adam with the Hebrew word mashal, but is working with us. Radal. So mashal was used in the uh, uh, fourth day of creation when he made the sun. Was that the third or fourth day? I can't remember now. I'm on the spot. Fourth day? Thank you, Tom. Fourth day of creation, God made the sun, and the word was used mashal. So God was working through the sun to create light instead of just light directly from him now. But uh, at least at this time before the fall, that's not how God was working with Adam. He was working... He wasn't working through him. He wasn't working through Adam to name these creatures. He was letting Adam do it. Go do it, Adam. I'm going to watch because this is hilarious. Okay. Anything for me? Yes. I think that's the last slide. Yeah. Oh, nope. I lied. Okay. We good. We still have five minutes. All right. Um, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds to the, of the heavens and to every beast of the field for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man while he slept. Uh, while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. Um, cause a deep sleep. So this tells us that sleep and rest come from God. 
because God caused it to happen. Deep, though. The word deep is used here. So that implies that there must have been sleep already existing in this eternal paradise you created, because why use the word deep sleep? Why not just sleep? Does that make sense? I, I got this from Got Questions when I was looking into this further. They're like this, so don't beat me up. All right, but apparently sleep must might have been a thing before the fall of creation, which is why they use deep sleep instead of just sleep. But sleep definitely comes from God, therefore it must be good. So it's likely that sleep, while not necessary for our glorified bodies concerning exhaustion, will exist in the eternal state. And again, that's not me. I mean, I kind of had this feeling it might be a thing, but then I looked into it, and again, sources I trust were saying the same thing. So we don't know if we'll be sleeping in the eternal state, but who loves naps? Yeah, I actually don't, but I do like sleep. All right. So if it's good, then maybe it will be there. Not that we'll need it, but... And while Adam slept... God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. Fun fact, rib bones have an unusual ability to regrow or repair large portions that are removed or damaged. Yeah. Like chameleons and tails. Oh, well, as far as bones are concerned, but as far as organs are concerned, maybe you're right about liver. I don't know. I'm no uh, doctor anatomy guy. But I looked into this and I confirmed this is a real thing. I'm not saying if a whole rig is taken out of you that it can come back, but if you snap it off, then apparently it can grow back. He's a neuro neurobiologist, and he's not even... Is that true, Jim? Jim, if, if part of your rib gets snapped off, can it grow back? Do you know? Yes. All right. It is done. It may be that bones in general have a tendency to splice themselves because I remember reading in National Geographic once about they dug up some Peruvian man who had lived 800 years ago and there was evidence that he'd had a broken leg because it was in his upper thigh and the bone was displaced so that it wasn't lined upright and it actually grew in an S curve and reconnected itself. Hmm. Oh. And he would have limped from then on because one leg would have been shorter than the other because of the bone displacement. Yeah. But they grew back together even though it wasn't straight. Yeah. yeah. And, and that kind of talks about what we talked about last week about how even creation itself can repair itself, wildfires, uh, oil spills, stuff like that. Um, we're almost at the end here. Hang in there. So this tells us that God did not start from scratch to make Eve out of the dust. All right, he made the he, he took from the rib bone and it grew back. Okay, <laughs> that's why he chose the rib bone. <laughs> Please do never take anything I say as truth. All right, fact check. All right, showing that both Adam and Eve are the same are of the same substance. Both are bearers of God's image and likeness. Eve was truly Adam's complement. Going to what someone said earlier. An integral part of who he was, a perfect companion, one flesh. And thus, you know, now we have marriage. And that's exactly like the relationship within the Trinity, right? Marriage reflects that. And this is the last one, because I remember ending on this topic. Adam and Eve and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Will there be clothes in heaven in the millennium in the eternal state? Oh, uh, there will be white robes, right? Sorry. <laughs> We'll probably wear clothes to improve on our appearance and comfort and perhaps as a reminder of what Christ did for us, but not because of shame or temptation. So if there is clothes, okay. Sorry, Carrie. All right. <laughs> and that's it. Anybody else have anything on any topic? Not necessarily that last slide there. Yeah. I've always wondered where language comes from. Adam named the animals. Yeah. Well, information theory, all information comes from God. Language came from God. There's three persons in the Trinity. They were communicating with each other perfectly. That's where it all comes from. Yeah, Tom. And that was something that came up in men's fraternity. We talked about why Eve wasn't created in time to name the animals. And we thought that the discussion, the discussion between the two of them might have taken years <laughs> for him to have named all the animals. Oh, yeah. Me and Carrie, we would have been a great team. I just would have said, go do it, Carrie, because I know it's going to be what you say anyway. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Kevin. Yes. Just a brief uh, presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, as you all know, this is Christmas time, 
It's oftentimes we give gifts of appreciation. So we as a class would like to present to you a small token of our appreciation Aww. and for all you do and will do. Thank you guys very much. And we have been getting your Christmas cards in the mail too, so thank you guys for that. Oh, that's very nice. I'm uh, Spoiler alert, next week, I know some of you liked my cheese ball when we first started coming here. I'm going to bring it next weekend, okay? So don't eat breakfast. <laughs> All right. Is that it? Thank you very much. Just just because it's Christmas and I'm going to, and you guys gave me cards and I'm going to give you cheese ball because that's how I show love, right? Cheese ball. All right.